This is Kane's Jawbone, a 90-year-old murder mystery puzzle book. Up until recently, it was believed that only three people had ever solved the so-called world's most difficult literary puzzle. And just this week, I got confirmation that my solution is correct. So I want to start off from the start and clear this mystery a bit. Because whenever anybody on the internet says that they solved Kane's Jawbone, it, the response is always, What do you mean? Only three people have ever solved Kane's Jawbone. Yeah, I mean that like so respectfully, but... Less than five people in history have solved Kane's Jawbone. So to clear this up a bit, because there's sort of a lot of myth about it. Originally, two people solve it when it's first released in the 1930s, and then it's out of print for 80, 80 years or so, where nobody's really trying to solve it. Unbound republished it in 2019. When it was republished, it wasn't a big hit. They said that 12 people, I think, had submitted by that original point that they had the first winner. So how many of them they sold? I don't know. John Finnemore, a British comedy writer, uh, but also, you know, probably somebody who would more likely have heard about the republishing of this book. He solves it and they actually start getting some press about the book. And then they release a new paperback edition, I think, which was the version that the following year, the TikTok was made about. I found this murder mystery book from 1934 where you have to figure out the six killers and their victims, but all the pages are printed out of order. Loads of articles, loads of videos made about it. And that's when the book becomes like a proper bestseller. But yet, to this day, officially, the number of people who've solved it is still the tree. But in reality, we know that at that point, after the TikToks went viral, the book became a lot more popular. We can just look at the Google Trends and the uh, TikTok going viral about it. The original release of the book barely even shows up on Google Trends. And last December was when Unbound confirmed with a lot of people who'd submitted by that point uh, whether or not they'd solved it. I have no idea how many there is, how many people have solved it at this point, but the number is definitely not three. Whether it's a few hundred or a few thousand, I don't know. And those confirmed solvers are very, very happy to look at other people's solutions and tell them, yeah, that's right. Or tell them, yeah, you need to look at this little area, this little area, that type of thing. Whether or not that's in the spirit of the book, I don't know. I've gotten three of those people to look at my solution and they all confirmed that, yeah, it was the same thing they submitted. So now you might be asking, well, if it's not even that hard to solve this book and everybody's solved it, why are you making a video about it? Weirdly, there's no videos by people who've solved it. If somebody is coming to this book and wants to try solve it, it would be a bit more approachable rather than the, the, the mythos being it's impossible, all this stuff. Oh, it's so hard. It's so hard. It's so hard. If it was just, hey, here's, here's some tips on how to solve it. A nice little guy being like, yeah, it is solvable. Um, they call it the world's most fiendishly difficult literary puzzle. That might be true, but I, I don't really know what the competition is. I think that gets a lot of people to buy the book, but then I think it actually turns a lot of people off once they get into solving it. So yeah, I it's hard, it's really difficult, but it is very, very doable. And yeah, if you find puzzles fun or just like, have a real motivation to do it, you could easily do it. I, I reckon I could teach very easily. I could teach a 10 year old to do this. They'd need some amount of guidance of like, oh, I'm stuck on this bit. I'm stuck on that. What does that mean? But I do, I think if you got like an average to, you know, interested, motivated 10 year old, I think they'd easily be able to solve it. It's hard, but it's just, that takes time. Now, the other thing that I think throws people off with this is, the book is always advertised as, what I think it says it on the back, millions of possible combinations. There is loads and loads of combinations, but you know, most of them, of the millions, a vast majority of them, no matter how much you look at it, won't make any sense. But the correct solution or something that's close to the correct solution will obviously start making a lot of sense as you go on. And as you put pages together, other pages will fall into place and what you're looking at will make sense because the story it's written in a very abstract fashion and is obviously using an older form of English dialect, very British dialect. But the story has, you know, foreshadowing. It's got a 
what I'd consider a Chekhov's gun. Um, the characters have motives. The story does make a lot of sense. The writing is what doesn't make sense. The, the, the way the story is told through the language, that's where stuff gets really, really confusing. The book is partly solving poetry and partly solving puzzles. Which I think that's what it says, like Ulysses. If, if James Joyce and Agatha Christie had a literary love child, that would be it. Reading the pages of this feels like trying to read Ulysses. But I will say I've never finished Ulysses and I did finish this. So that says something. But like, yeah, if you look at stuff like Finnegan's Wake, this is way easier to read than Finnegan's Wake. I realised when I did my original recording, uh, I never really mentioned how I actually got into solving the book. I went to see See How They Run with my girlfriend and her housemates. And then when we came home afterwards, they mentioned the movie reminded them of this book that my girlfriend had gotten called Kane's Jawbone that she'd heard about on TikTok. We soon learned that she hadn't ripped out a single page yet. That night we did manage to convince her to finally rip out a page, which I think hurt her soul a little bit. And then we were off, we were solving them as a group that night, and then I bought my own copy a few days later, but I did another one or two sessions with other people looking at pages, but then it eventually turned into a solo mission. I was really focused on finishing it for Christmas, but I didn't meet the original deadline and then I just sort of kept working on it on and off until eventually I became very focused on trying to finish it and I managed to get through. My first piece of advice is, to people who I see going wrong is, the murder boards. This is just for show. This is useless. You don't need to stick them up on the wall. Uh, but that's like the number one thing that everybody seemed to do because uh, they thought it would be fun. And it is fun to stick it up on the wall and it looks good, but I don't think it's an effective way to do anything. I think the, the murder board thing with the tread, the cork board thing, all that stuff, I think that's mainly for locations. I think when they actually use that for solving real crimes, it's about um, doing a point where each of the murders happen and then you're able to find the average area of where your murderer potentially lives, like if you're a tracking Zodiac or something, to figure out what state he potentially lives in. But for this, it doesn't really make any sense. They're just, they're not, it's not gonna help you. There is other people and resources um, to help you if you get stuck. Obviously, you know, the fun of this is using that stuff as little as possible to try and just do this by yourself. Although by yourself, you're still using Google a lot. Yeah, you sometimes see people who are like, I'm gonna do this without using Google, just my own brain. No way. Unless if you were, if you are a intellectual, a high society intellectual living in 1930s England and you're like the top of your game. Other than that, you're gonna need books. Obviously in the 1930s, it was designed that you'd have a number of books that you would get to solve this mystery. He sort of gives hints to, oh, this is the book you need back in the 30s. Somebody would go and find that book from a library then look true for the relevant thing. It would have been really hard. Nowadays, you're just gonna take passages from this book and you're gonna put them into Google. And sometimes, this is important, sometimes the Reddit tread of somebody else looking for that page will come up. Try to avoid that and try to just go to the actual information that comes up. There's a few resources that will come up again and again. I think it's definitely doable to try to stay away from any of the help that's already on the internet. And then just when you're really stuck on something, you can go and find out. There was one thing I was stuck on the most was one of the murderers or victims, one of their surnames I needed to get. I couldn't find it anywhere. And I kept looking over the pages again and again and again. And then eventually I asked for help. And then what's great on the Reddit is they won't just give you the answer. They'll normally say, oh, take another look at this page or take another look at this set of pages and you can go through. And they're sort of just giving you a hint to where the help is. Every page of this book, you need to do something on every single page. But like, if you look at a lot of the ones behind me, there'll only be like two or three things that are highlighted. What I became quite good at during the second half of solving this is, I was very good at knowing what I was looking for. And so I'd be able to scan the page, read through it, and then see, okay, I think this is, this is just sort of some extra fluff. 
this isn't part of it. And then I'd be able to pick out the sentence that I'd go, oh, I think that's important. And especially as you go on, you really get to know what you're looking for from certain sections. Because all we need to know is the six uh, murderers and victims, and then the order of the pages. There's no other, solving the mystery doesn't involve understanding absolutely everything about every single page. I don't think anybody understands absolutely everything in every single page. It's definitely possible even after solving it to go back and to try and figure out more things about what exactly was happening on the different pages. Reading it sort of reminds me of doing a reading comprehension in a language that you only have like a basic understanding of. Like I remember in school, we'd have to answer questions about a passage written in French and I wasn't that good at French, but what I was good at was looking at the questions and then finding out from the questions what information I needed from the passage. And then I'd be able to read the passage and just find the little bits that I needed to know without understanding everything. A very similar thing happens when you're reading this book. There's one time where I was looking for so long on this loop and Googling a thing and then that brought me down to something else. And then I solved that whole bit and it was, you know, halfway down the page. The second half of the page was just a punchline to that thing that I'd found at the top. So I figured out what the joke was, but I sort of, it didn't really get me anywhere in terms of the mystery. So this is the point where uh, if you really don't want to know anything about the, the structure of the puzzle, uh, I'd recommend just going ahead and, and leaving the video. Um, I just want to go in on one, one little thing one little part of the structure that really, really helps you once you know. And I see a lot of people who go too far without knowing this um, and they end up going in circles. And it's just a thing which can really get you going straight away. And I think, I think it's better if you know this. This is all I'm gonna say in terms of spoilers. So you won't get more than this out of me. But this book contains chapters. Um, it has a certain amount of chapters. I won't say how many or what the thing about the chapters are, but as you understand other books to have chapters, this book has chapters. And so it's great because you're not solving one big, massive 100 page sequence. You're solving a bunch of smaller little things. The two elements of solving the puzzle, really, honestly, this is all it really is, is first of all, finding out which chapter each of the pages belongs to, which for some of them is really hard. For some of them is really easy, especially one. There's one which is basically a freebie. And it is why I sort of think, you know, the author is like, oh, the, the most fiendishly difficult literary puzzle. The guy wants you to solve it. I do think he like gives you breadcrumbs. He gives you clues. He's not, you know, he does, uh, I believe, name himself after a uh, uh, somebody used to torture people but he he does give you those little breadcrumbs and one of them is one of the chapters one of the chapters anybody could look through this book I think and find that chapter and then that's great because once you have that chapter you can go and solve that chapter just by itself uh, which you know once you have your smaller amount of chapter it's a lot easier to then find the order you're just looking through see what the similarities are try to figure out what the story is. And then at a certain point in solving a chapter, you'll figure out what that particular puzzle is. Most of the chapters have a thing about them, which is that sequence. And then once you sort of find what the game is, you'll find it very easy to find them. Some of the pages will be harder than others. Some of them will be, like I said, freebies, and some of them will be involved more Googling and trying to figure out what link it is. Some of them will just be really confusing and abstract. There's one, one or two of the chapters that are really hard to put in order. And for those ones, I just sort of moved them around until things started feeling right. And then the clues became a bit more obvious after it was sort of in the right order. But then once you have the pages in order, it's just a matter of reading through and seeing if you understand what's happening in this chapter from the plot. Um, which, yeah, might become pretty apparent. And like I said, it'll be one of those things where, you know, of each page, a little bit of it is dedicated to which chapter is it in. A little bit of each page is dedicated to which order, which part of the order it's coming in. 
and then a little bit of the page will be dedicated to um, the actual plot of what's happening on that page. And then there'll be a few little jokes and allusions and stuff. But hopefully you'll be able to read the chapter and then you'll be able to figure out whether there was a murder or not, uh, if there was, who murdered who. That is one of the hardest things, I think, is actually figuring out the names of some of the some of the characters featured. Um, because to solve the puzzle, we need their exact first name and last name. That was definitely, I think, the thing that I struggled with the most. The main thing is there's still, I think, six months left. The end of this year, they've said they'll keep taking in uh, entries uh, for the like trying to submit your solution and stuff. And then I have a feeling that type of stuff is going to die down after this January. I'd say that might be when they finally release the new count of how many people have solved it. And maybe they'll say we're not going to correct the correct solution anymore. Maybe they'll release the solution to the internet. I don't know. As far as I know, still to this day, if you did just want to totally cheat and go try and find the answer, I don't think you can. I think the only thing you could do is ask for help. But yeah, there's still six months left. Um, and then they're planning on releasing a how to solve Kane's Jawbone book, I think. I don't know how how spoilery that's going to be, if that's going to be like as vague as this video or if it's going to go into detail, like breaking down every single page. I'd love that. <laughs> There's loads of stuff that I still don't know and stuff that where I'm not quite sure what was happening or I think it was this, but I'm not certain. Um, so that'd be really interesting to read. And then the first solver of the of this century, um, John Finnamore, he's writing a sequel uh, to the book, but obviously a spiritual sequel. It's not actually going to continue the story or anything. And so I'm excited to see that. The thing I'm really interested with that is, is he going to write it as if it could have been written in 1930s, but like much older references? Or is there going to be like references to modern pop culture? Because some of the pop culture in this is very highbrow, but I think some of it too, you know, obviously it's 1930s England, but some of it is sort of the equivalent of if you were writing one now and you'd be like referencing pop stars and stuff. I'm excited to see what he does for the next one. I'm also excited to see, <laughs> this is my biggest advice to uh, him writing his new book. He needs to add in a bit where you actually need to make a murder board. You had to put the pages in a certain layout and then connect your string between two pages and whatever word this two strings crosses on was, that's the thing you need to find. I think you could do that because it's very clear that when people bought this book, what they actually wanted was an excuse to make a murder board and give it to them. They want to do it. The main thing this has made me want to do is write my own one. I'd love to do like a modern, set in modern times, long form puzzle book. I don't think I'd do the out of order thing though. I think just in order and sort of maybe more logic puzzly than this ended up being, you know, with some Einstein puzzles. I don't know. I liked reading this book. I enjoyed solving this book. I really enjoyed the satisfaction of having solved it. This is a review now. My review is, you know, five stars uh, for Kane's Jawbone.